Hey everybody, um, welcome back to the last of the four pollinator um, webinars. And this one is focusing on perennials. <clears throat> um, so what I thought we'd do is have a, a revisit some of the um, plants that we've looked at in the last four sessions and also look at some new ones. Um, now perennials, of course, are plants that are going to um, return year after year. So once we've planted them, they will come back year after year and provide forage for pollinators in our gardens. And often pollinators are seen as being quite cost effective. Um, they're a, a good alternative to bedding or basket plants um, because they are actually, you know, one, one spend and you've got years and years of pleasure from them. And usually they get bigger year after year. Okay, we're going to start small and work out the bigger beds and things. So I just kind of wanted to go back 12 months really to this pot that we made up in the autumn, I think. Uh, I think it was last September. Um, and you may remember it was an old metal bucket that um, had a few holes in the bottom actually, natural holes. And what we did... flower stems which have lots and lots of flower flowers along the um, edge of them and they're absolutely gorgeous beautiful blue color and excellent for early foraging bees particularly in March April time and that's been really happy in that bucket I've kept it well watered um, when we put it in it was just a small sort of patch um, of our jugger and you can see that it's it's absolutely spread around the outside of the bucket, spread over the sides. <clears throat> and this would quite happily now root, if I was to put that onto some, uh, some moist compost, that would happily root from here. And you'd get lots and lots of new plants from that one. Um, so that'll be your job for the next sort of August, September time to do that and, and produce more plants from from that one plant. <clears throat> in that as well, as a nice contrast to the burgundy leaf, we've got the astilbe. Now this astilbe is a purpley sort of maroony colored one. Um, and it is starting now to produce flower spike, spikes. You can see them just forming here. And they're going to be a lovely burgundy color uh, once they grow up to maturity. And that will provide forage for the sort of August into September, possibly into October. And then we've got here these beautiful leaves of the hellebore. And the hellebore is a winter into spring flowering perennial. Um, you'll see here I've left the dead flower heads on. This has just turned brown recently and you can see that the seed heads have just emptied. Um, they've sprinkled themselves into the pot probably, um, but I could have collected those and again produced more perennials from those. Hellebores are fairly slow growing but very hardy and really good for winter uh, forage as well. And in the back here we've got a cowslip and the cowslip seeds are probably still in there. Again, very easy to grow cowslips from seed. You can see they're in there. Um, very easy to um, sow them and really good um, germination rate if you do want to have a go with that one. So that's the cowslip, which flowered March, April time. We've got the autumn flowering a jugger sorry the spring flowering a jugger with autumn colour <clears throat> we've got the winter hellebore and we've got the summer to autumn time a stilby so we've got plants almost for every season in the one bucket there and it just kind of illustrates I think how even if you have got just a backyard something like that with carefully selected perennials can give really good colour and flowering right through the seasons 
and will provide something for foraging insects and you know pollinators in particular right through the 12 months and that literally has had very little done with it in 12 months um, it's ready now to to you know do something with you could um, uh, easily sort of produce more flowers from the one there you could split it up this will still be probably split as well but <clears throat> it's been very happy there just for 12 months so that was a really good um, a good little sort of pot I think that we did last year so I'll go on to look at some others now um, just in the summertime there we um, we had a session where we looked at containers and you may remember that we planted up a thyme container in a, an old cow trough. Um, now my cat's been in here and she's dug up half of the container so I've just kind of left that because it's pointless trying to fight with her really. But you can see that we've got some beautiful thymes in here. Um, from one plant we've got a huge area here of creeping red which bees in particular love. This is thyme cochineus creeping red. We've got the lemonade thyme, which smells absolutely gorgeous. Beautiful lilac colour. We've got the orange scented thyme. And in the back there, there's a golden, no, it isn't, it's a silver queen. We've got the lovely golden thyme. And we've got one at the front, which is called Dune Valley. These have had less of a chance, of course, because the cat's been scratching at them. But you can see how, without a cat, you would have a beautiful big planter full of colour and that has been absolutely covered in bees particularly over the last three to four weeks and it's still going strong into July. So I'm really pleased with how that's turned out. I think that's been fabulous. My um, basket that I made, the hanging basket that I made up, you may remember this. We popped in again an ajuga. This is um, a variegated one which has spread like mad and again is ready to split and root. It's got a beautiful um, uh, Brestingham uh, thyme in the side here, a creeping prostrate rosemary which will flower in the spring, an orange thyme, she's just going over now. Lemon thyme, which is in flower, coming into flower. We popped in the garlic chives, and the garlic chives will flower in the summertime and each year because all of those plants in there are perennial. We've got um, a cam chamomile as well in here at the front, which should be flowering soon. Okay, so that was the wildlife friendly um, hanging basket that we made up. Uh, I think it was in uh, late April into May when we made that up and it's doing really well. I've been very pleased with it. Um, it's produced a lot of lovely flower and it should go on to do that throughout the year. And that's kind of what we're doing, isn't it? We're trying to provide pollinators with um, uh, forage that they can use right throughout the year, not just in one season. So that's, that's important. I just round the corner here. If you have got a bit more space, you might like to produce something like a raised bed. Um, and if you can just film around here, well, my son's here. Okay. See that it's got three courses of brick. It's very old. It's been here probably about 10 years now, 10 to 12 years. And it's got three courses of brick um, filled with some um, top soil or some compost. And it's got apple mint which is just about to start to flower, usually flowers in August. Campanula, and you can see the beautiful contrast of colours and textures, which is really, really buzzing with bees today. Campanula is really, really popular. And that has spread so quickly over the last three or four years. Again, very little you need to do to it really. Once it's flowered, you can cut it back um, and it comes again year after year with very little, um, very little inter, you know, in, inter, interception, interference. Okay, just over here, um, just a bit more interesting really, the shape of this um, raised bed. We've got the lavender raised bed, which is again all perennial. 
we've got the lavender meal oak, which you saw me plant um, earlier on in one of the webinars. They're doing very well, not flowering just yet, but they're getting there. You can see the buds starting to appear. Um, I cut back some of these older lavenders, if you remember, and they were really cut back until just an inch above the green. And that's worked out very well. They've come back very happily. You can just see, you might be able to just see in right back until there's just an inch of green visible. And they've really bushed up very well. Uh, you can see again, this is a head cut lavender. And again, same has happened. It's really um, come back very well. These were newer plants and you can see they're starting to flower a little bit earlier. The head cut lavender, it's a beautiful dark purple. It's my favourite, I think, the head cut. I'll show you the label there. Okay, that's a really nice one. Grows to about 18 inches maximum. And then you can see the contrast in colour between the head cut and this one. And much smaller than some of um, a good perennial to go for really lavender if you have the right conditions and these raised beds really are ideal for lavender because they're well drained for some sand or water because water logging really is what kills lavender. We'll just take a, a walk over here. Again, if you are working with pots, um, a nice idea is to sort of team up. I've got three blue pots there, um, and they're just old pots we've had them for years. But just re sort of revitalise them this year by putting in some new, some new uh, perennials. So in the front one here, we've got Nepeta, and this is Nepeta Persian, and that's going to produce a plant of about. 12 to 18 inches, big round pot full of flower. And this is extremely attractive to pollinators. And of course, cats love it as well. And then behind we have salvia. This is salvia hot lips. And you can see the white tips of the hot lips there. And the red, and they change color according to the weather. Now, the best way to deal with salvia hot lips once it's flowered, so once that stem's finished flowering, is to just trim it off there and you'll get more side shoots coming and it'll make a nice bushy plant. If you think it's starting to look a little bit spindly, give it a bigger chop. Don't be frightened to chop salvia, it doesn't mind at all, and you'll make a much thicker and chunkier plant. This is the first year plant, but it's doing very well, it's flowering really well. Next year, I'll leave it in the pot, cut it back quite, quite hard really, to two or three inches above the ground, and it'll be a much bigger uh, plant, which will fill that pot completely. I wouldn't put anything else in with it, doesn't really need anything. Uh, if you're going to keep it in that pot, then um, it'll be fine on its own because it really will fill it. And in the third pot, we've actually got these Welsh poppies. Um, now these Welsh poppies are fabulous. They seed themselves everywhere and you can see why. Because once they're flowered, they produce so many seed. And we just need to scatter that seed and we'll have a lot more. And they're a beautiful yellow flower, which 
pop up everywhere. They love to come up between the, the paving stones. And you can see here, we've got a log star. They come up between the gaps there. But they are very pretty and very popular because they've got that lovely open flower. But they are perennial and they do see themselves well. Okay, you may remember that we looked at the herb planters last time. And again, all herbs that are popped in there are all perennial herbs, all doing very well. I just want to show you the winter savoury, because it's really nice to see the winter savoury flowering. You don't often see that. It's a lovely white flower, very small, but um, lots and lots of um, flowers all together, which make it a very efficient um, food source for many pollinators. Traditionally, winter savoury was grown with peas and beans um, because it was thought to increase the yield of your peas and beans. And also it was eaten with peas and beans because by eating the winter savoury, it apparently reduces flatulence that the peas and beans cause. So quite good companion plant and companion ingredient really. And here, Hyssop, again, another really lovely hardy perennial, as long as it's planted in the right position, really needs a dry raised bed somewhere where it's not going to be waterlogged and where it isn't going to be um, frozen for a long period of time. It will stand frost. And after it's flowered, it should be cut down to about that level. And new growth will come from the bottom again in the spring. But these blue flowers are so attractive to so many insects. Hoverflies particularly love it. And again, this can be planted in your vegetable plot to encourage pollinators to pollinate peas and beans, tomatoes, etc. So that's hyssop. Um, in the past, I've, gr I've grown hyssop, uh, blue hyssop and pink hyssop and white hyssop. This year, I've just got the blue hyssop, which really is the most popular and grows, I think, the most successfully, really. But it's a very dis distinctive and quite strong smell, but uh, very attractive. And it, it actually seems to discourage mice and seems to discourage um, blue bottles and flies. Um, but attracting the, the beneficial pollinators. Okay, so over here, um, if we stand back well, um, you'll see that um, the planter that we started to plant up last time has really come on very well. We looked at um, plants for pollinators and particularly planters for pollinators. And this is a really good group, um, space saving planter really um, my husband's come up with this design and I think it's it's really successful not just for bedding and basket plants but also for the, the perennials we've got the buddleia here this is buddleia buzz and this is the lavender uh, variety the buddleia buzz lavender um, in the middle here what we have, I think this one is the magenta, and then we have the candy pink. I haven't got the labels in there, I'm afraid, but you can see the flower head is starting to form there. And these are buddleia that are going to grow to um, around about 24 inches maximum. So that's almost at full height now. And then they do form beautiful flower heads and then side shoots of flower heads as well. So you're going to get a lot of flowering for quite a small buddleia there. And like all buddleia, it's very easy to propagate. So you can make lots of new ones. 
from one plant and really attractive for butterflies in particular. Lots and lots of um, species love Buddleia. Um, such a beautiful um, range of colours here. I'm really looking forward to see the, the, the lavender and the magenta and the candy pink together. I think it'll be really attractive. Especially, you know, with the, the copper snowflake in the bottom here as that trails down. And up here we've got um, salvia. This is salvia hot lips. But I'm sorry, it isn't hot lips. This is salvia amethyst lips. And it, you can see it's like a purple velvet. And this has been, um, it's grown really well this year. Last year I found it a little bit slower. But I think it's liked the, the drier weather this year. Seems to be a little bit less um, sort of quick to grow than the salvia hot lips. But I think it's worthwhile because it, the colour is just so amazing and very attractive to pollinators. We've got one on the other side. I do like a bit of balance in the planters. So that is a perennial. And in the middle here, we've got salvia midnight candles. And you can see beautiful specks of little white, which just seem to show the pollinating insects where to go. And lots and lots and lots of the same uh, flower together, flower heads together, which make it efficient for the insects, of course. What a gorgeous colour that is, so lovely. Um, now I've left this top shelf because I really kind of wanted to see how the other plants kind of um, developed. But today I want to pop in a couple um, of different varieties of plants. So you may have come across verbena before. This is verbena bonarensis and this is meteor shower. Now um, it's a shortened variety so it's it's been developed in order to use it in smaller um, pots rather than in the ground and it is easier to, ma to manage because it doesn't snap quite as easily as the verbena bonarensis that you might be familiar with. So this one is only going to grow to about 80 centimetres maximum. Um, so not much taller than it is now. I'm going to put one on the other side as well. And then I'm going to plant this one, which is scabious. Scabious is absolutely wonderful at attracting butterflies. And you can see this plant is pretty good because it's got quite a lot of compost around for the depth of soil that some of these perennials are going to need. Okay, so that should keep them going quite well. And then in the middle there, I'm going to put this small shrub. Um, and this is a hebe, which will only grow to about 45 centimetres tall. So it's a, a nice one to add to a planter. Again, it, it prefers um, free draining soil and it's fairly hardy. And I think it'll do very well here because we're right up against uh, the greenhouse. So I don't think it will take any harm and it should grow really well. And the variegated leaf just looks so lovely with the mauve flowers of these two plants. I'm just going to stick the label in there. Okay. So you can see if we carry on and sort of do a mirror image. We've got the verbena there, the meteor shower. We've got the scabious there, which is a, this is a, a smaller variety of scabious. I'm growing the um, taller variety as well, which I'll show you later. And that one is the hebe, which only grows to about 45, which will be a nice compact little shrub in the middle. And then we're going to carry on and do a mirror image on the other side of the planter. So you'll 
you can see how it's going to kind of look as I finish that off. So that should attract lots of different butterflies on, on the top, really, particularly, and then more sort of bees and then butterflies on the bottom. So I think within that planter, really, we've got a really nice um, variety of um, insects that are going to be visiting. I should have probably mentioned that the Sabinias, the, um, these are the, the trailing petunias, very attractive to um, moths. And I found that, especially in the evening, that we get, we get a lot of moths um, coming and visiting the Sabinias. Okay, I just want to come over onto the lawn here and I'll show you a variety of perennials that I find are particularly good. attracting uh, pollinators. So we've got here Achillea, beautiful pink one. Another uh, scabious, this one's called Perfecta Alba. White as the name would suggest, I do love white flowers. You can see the lovely open aspect is so popular uh, with butterflies particularly. Penstemon, and really good for long-tongued bumblebees. I always find that hard to say, I'm not sure why. Long-tongued bumblebees. <laughs> um, and then this one here is the Coastman, and this one is, I think this one is banana cream, and it's a yellowy, creamy yellowy one, which is lovely. Um, I grow several of the lobelia, the upright lobelia, which um, are quite a marginal plant really, like to be quite wet, um, full sun or um, semi-shade. And I've got a nice variety, which is a nice red one called Queen Victoria. This is the purpley blue one called Fan Blue. But that one will grow and flower right through the summer and into autumn really. Really popular colour the purple of course with those insects. And it's the first year we've grown these but these are arignium. This is jade frost which um, is a variegated sea holly. This will flower from June to August. Um, particularly like the foliage and really looking forward to seeing the flower. And I'm kind of thinking that once the um, insects, pollinating insects, have foraged among it, I think the birds will probably love the seed heads and, and then I'll probably chop them off and use them um, in dried flower arrangements and in wreath making because uh, I'm thinking there's quite a lot for this, this plant. It's a very versatile, and very attractive looking one. So I'm looking forward to having that for the first year. Um, we've got Veronica. Again, spires of lots of little tiny flowers, which insects can access. And I just want to sort of focus on the hardy geraniums. Now, hardy geraniums are one of those perennials that you can stick in, and quite honestly, they stick around for tens of years. 20, 30 years, I know uh, my grandparents had a Johnson's blue geranium when I was a little girl, and I know it's still there. So they are invincible, really, and they spread so well. This one is, I don't know the variety of this one, but I have one called Foundling Friend, which is a lovely pink one. And I'll just show you what is a kind of the right thing to do at the moment maybe if you do have hardy geraniums because we've got quite a few in our bed here with the um with the lady's mantle it goes really quite well with the lady's mantle i think you can see the johnson's blue geraniums just starting to fade now with all that sunshine we've had and the seed heads are forming so what what really you could do at this point, in order to produce more flowering um, for the late summer, is to give it a really good chop. 
Um, and what you need to do really is just get in there with a sharp pair of shears and give it a really good haircut right down to the bottom. And if you can just focus in on the bottom there, Will, can you see that new leaves are just beginning to form? And if you do take away those dead flower heads, you can see that new growth is coming. And within three or four weeks, you'll see it'll be, you know, a good foot tall. And then going into the end of August into September, you should have another flush of beautiful blue flowers um, to replace the old ones. So you can see it's really worth doing this because it gives you two two crops of flowers for the pollinators to enjoy. So that's a top tip really for the hardy geraniums. I just wanted to show you that uh, just in this area here, we've got a patch where we haven't really got much going on. We've got the, the blue geraniums, we've got the, um, the mollusks, the um, ladies mantle. And I just want to pop in a couple of plants there um, into the gaps. So I'll just get my trowel. And just really to kind of um, a blend with the um, Lady's mantle and Johnson's blue geranium. I'm just going to pop in the pen stem. You'll see the contrast of colours is really lovely. The red and the yellow and the blue, I think, look so lovely together. And behind here, we've got some little calendula. These are just annuals. But you can see they're just opening up in the sunshine. They're really pretty too. So just a little pen stem in there, just tucked away. Um, another plant that I think is would do really well in there is this one. And this is um, a type of primula. And it's primula viale. Now primula viale really likes a bit of moisture really want to be drying out. It wilts very easily and a sort of semi-shared spot is probably ideal. It's known as the red hot poker primula, flowering from the bottom to the top um, and it is such a beautiful colour contrast, the red and the purple and I think it goes really nicely with the lime green um, of this shrub here. So that's a really nice contrasting one. And then we've got another purple uh, primula to go in the back there, because I do like red and purple together. I think it looks lovely. And this one is called um, Beziana. And the clue is in the name. It really is attractive to bees, this one. And that one will spread very well. So a nice clash of colours there, purple, red, and then yellow in the background, and the yellow of the ladies' mantle. And as they spread, that little gap will be filled. We need to do a little bit of weeding in the back there, well, I think. There's a bit of bindweed coming through. Yes. Okay, so if we just um, pop round this area here. The Dianthus, I'll just point out there, was planted, oh my goodness, probably two years ago and comes back each year, produces a little sort of feathery flower, which is really pretty, I think. Lovely pale pink. Another hardy geranium, I'm not sure of the um, variety, you may know. 
this one was here, I think, when we arrived, and we've been here 21 years now. But it is a lovely colour. Now, just behind the hedge here, it's a fairly sort of shady spot, really. Um, and I've got a couple of the Nepeta that you saw in the pots earlier on. These are flowering so beautifully. Um, I just thought it would be a really nice place for them to just come and sit right by the um, pathway here. We may add several um, along this pathway um, because of course bees and other pollinating insects love a swathe of the same plant and that is another efficient way for them to um, receive their their food. So we, we kind of should plant in sections rather than just in singles. So if you're tempted ever to buy a plant, never just buy one, always buy three or five is what I say. Not because I'm selling them, of course, but it always makes a better job. And of course, it is better for the pollinating insects to have several get them weeds out at the same time. Okay, it's got a bit of bark down here to try and keep the weeds under control, but never easy. Okay. Ant nest. Yeah, I think there are some ants in there. Yeah, just a couple. <laughs> and we'll just move this bit along. There's one in here. And beside us, just um, where I'm digging we've got Rebecca and this is Goldstrom. Um, it's a lovely yellow autumn flowering um, flower, a big open daisy flower. He might be familiar with um, Rebecca. It's really worth growing uh, especially if your autumn um, offer isn't so great in your garden. Um, it really is great, sort of August into September, the Rebecca. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a couple of Nepeta there, which will spread, and they're going to make a plant of about two feet by two feet. Um, and of course, the cats are going to absolutely love those. And then we've got Hookera, and this is Hollywood. Now, it's the first year that I've grown Hookera, but I wanted something with which would provide a bit of autumn colour um, and so I've gone for the hookah and we'll see how they they do. Um, just want to move across this way. I want to plant them here. Just going to plant one here if I can get the spade in. Yep. Just for a bit of um, variety of foliage really because the yellow of the Rebecca will contrast really well with um, that foliage and the red of the Hollywood uh, flower spikes as they come through. It's there. I'll just put that one there just to remove We've kind of left some clover in the grass, you'll see, and there's a few daisies as well. And it just, instead of putting down um, a brick path or a wooden path or a shilly path, my husband just decided, well, we'll put down a grassy path, but we'll let it be a natural grassy path. And that actually does attract pollinators as well. So it's a good idea, you know, to think about the pathways um, that you're putting in. Obviously it needs cut and it can be a little bit wet in the winter, but it does add a little bit of contrast to the chilies that we have all the way around the rest of the garden. So that's something maybe to think about. Okay, well, we'll carry on walking. Um, I want it's a shrub, I do want to sort of mention this beautiful Dutzia, which is buzzing at the moment 
Yeah. He might be able to see. It's difficult to find them. There they are. Yeah, no, it's got one. But... There's one there, look. Yeah, I think that's a buff-tailed bumblebee. Yeah. yeah. Um, so beautiful, beautiful um, clusters, really, of flowers on this shrub. And it is, it's been in probably about five years. Um, it was probably about two feet tall when we put it in, but it really does produce flowers um, in abundance. And it's very popular with bees. So that might be one that you might think about, Dutzia. Um, this area of perennials here is autumn um, helianthus. And this is a lemon helianthus, which is very, very tall, grows to about six feet. Um, and then we've got flocks, big sections of flocks here. And we've got ice plant. And to the right and to the left, we have Budlia. And this is just coming into flower. You can see there's a purple flower just starting to come, and that is going to be a magnet for the butterfly shortly. These are standard Budlias. These are the Budlia buzz. These are the standard. Hi everyone, sorry, I think uh, Helen's lost connection. She should be back there, oh, here she is. Hi Helen, are you back? So we're just saying that along the pathway here, we have Jamanda, and Jamanda is a lovely evergreen um, perennial, herb really um, which produces lovely pink flowers it hasn't flowered just yet it's usually July into August um, and it can be used instead of box hedging and uh, this is Jamanda hedge um, and it can it can be clipped and you can kind of make it almost kind of like box um, it can be you know sort of cut into shape really and it produces that lovely pink flower, which again is very popular with pollinators. So on the left hand side of the path here, you'll see that we've got um, the box, the traditional box, which isn't brilliant for pollinators. But on the, on the right of the path, we have the Jamanda, which we're trialling really to see how, how, uh, how good it is to sort of line the path. And I think it's pretty good. It's a lovely shiny leaf. And we do like the fact that it flowers as well. Now, just over on the right here, just by a compost bin, really, you'll see we've got bees all over the Nepita. That colour is so attractive. And just in flower here, in, in bud here, we have the marjoram. And that is marjoram, that's a gold-tipped uh, gold marjoram, which is just about to flower. And that again will be really popular. He's off. Okay. Now these are the, um, I've got a little patch here that um, used to be the children's little area of garden, but they don't seem to want to, to come and, and cultivate it at the moment. So we've got a little space and we're going to pop in some of the scabious. This one is Misty Butterflies. 
and I'll just show you the label at the back. So its spread is just 25 to 20 centimetres. And again, great for rockeries, great for pots. And like the one that we put into the planter, it should remain quite compact. And we're going to put those into there and probably the borage will probably come up around them as well. You can see there's a borage coming up through here and right through our um, Cobra French climbing beans there. Borage will be popping up throughout the summer. You can see it's just seeding itself everywhere there. Okay, so we'll have a look further down towards the bottom of the garden. Um, here that we've got lots and lots of alpine strawberries which we've left in and they've seeded themselves um, again really popular with the bees and um, producing these lovely little tiny strawberries which mice absolutely love they're and birds of course as well love them but they're a really lovely little environment for lots of mammals. It's a really nice little place for them to visit, I'm sure. Okay. If you come down to the bottom of the garden, you'll see, I think we looked last, last time we were um, doing the webinar at the fennel. And you can see um, how much the fennel's grown now. This is the bronze fennel. And this is a really hardy perennial. It's in a little wooden raised bed here and it gets evening sunshine particularly. But it's grown now to probably about six feet. And you can see the flower heads beginning to form. Now they will produce big umbels of flower, which will be really attractive to butterflies, hoverflies, bees. Um, right throughout the season, right throughout the summer season. And then behind there, we've got Buddleia, just as backup for the butterflies. So that's fennel. And I use fennel um, a lot in flower arranging, actually. I love to see um, a sprig of fennel in among um, the cut garden flowers. I think it looks fabulous. But it's perennial. Bergamot hasn't done very well this year. I think it's been a bit dry and it's gone quite um, mildewed. So I have been spraying it to try and get that mildew off. And bicarbonate sort of, sort of watered down with some warm water um, does help. But it has suffered this year and I think it is dry weather. This is a green fennel. Again, producing lots of flowers very soon. That the flowers will form there and this is all edible as well as being really attractive to the pollinators. This is the last um, perennial that I want to show you today is Aresimum and this is Aresimum bowls mauve. Now this um, plant, this perennial has been in here in this raised bed for about five years now I should think, four or five years. Um, and you can see it's flowered right from the bottom of the stem, right the way up the stem till the very end. And once it gets to the end, like this one here, it can be cut off, composted, and then new plants will form. And you can see those new ones there starting to form. Really attractive and full of flower and this one flowers literally eight to ten months of the year it will start flowering february march time and sometimes it's still continuing to flower at christmas one plant produces all of these flowers which is amazing so we'll just walk slowly up the lawn and i think i'm nearly out of time now but if you have any questions about perennials in particular or anything that we've covered in the last um, four webinars, then have a think and let me know at the end in a few moments. I just want to show you the lawn before we finish. 
because I've persuaded my husband to leave it an extra week or two. And this is what we have. So we've got fabulous white clover and we've got self-heal. We've got a bee in the clover there, you can see, right on cue. <laughs> and we've got buttercups butter, butter and we've got daisies. So we've got a real variety in the lawn rather than just grass. And I think it looks lovely. And it makes probably a, it's a huge difference to the pollinating insects that are visiting the garden. So, does anybody have any questions? Is there anybody still there? Thank you, Helen, we're still here. <laughs> that was excellent, thank you. Um, uh, We've got one question from Peter. Since we will, um, they lost, dropped the webinar at times, Helen, the, um, the signal went. They're asking if you'd be able to list the plants um, or review and list the plants you listed, if you remember. I can't, I can't hear you very well, Lucy. Can you not? Can you hear me now? No, cause I can hear you now because I've got the phone closer to my ear. <laughs> Yeah. But you're going to have to have a view of the garden. <laughs> so the webinar dropped out a couple of times. Um, yeah. Peter's asking, would you be able to list the plants you listed? Yes, I would. Would you like me to send those to you, Lucy? Yeah. Or would, would you really like me to just talk, talk them through now? You could talk them through now. Yeah, that would work. Yeah. Um, so when did it drop out? Do you know? Um, we looked at Nepeta. We looked at the Nepeta Persian, P-U-R-R-S-I-A-N. We looked at the um, Achillea. We looked at Dutzia, the big shrub, the big pink shrub that's just in front of you there. Um, we looked at Germanda, which was the hedge Germanda that we're using instead of box on the pathway. Uh, we looked at salvia hot lips and salvia amethyst lips. Um, I'll just take you back to the um, plants that we looked at, uh, the, list, the collection of plants that I had here. So we had um, Veronica, Achillea, Scabius, the white one is Scabius. I'll show you the label. Perfecta Alba. Uh, we looked at Lobelia. That was fan blue. I also have um, the Queen Victoria, the red one. We had uh, Salvia Midnight Candle, which is a nice one. That's the one that was in the big planter, little white dots. And the hardy geraniums, I'm afraid I don't know the name of that one. The one I'm growing at the moment is Foundling's Friend, and it's a pink one. And Johnson's Blue is the one that I cut back. So that's geranium Johnson's Blue. Um, anybody else want to know, or was it the uh, Arignium, the sea holly? Arignium Jade Frost. Oh, just trying to think what else I looked at. Hookera, perhaps, Hollywood. And the big purple plant at the bottom of the polytunnel was uh, Ericium, um Bowls Mauve. If anybody else, if there are any other questions, any other um any other queries about um, plants, please get in touch and I'll, I'll try and give you a list. Yeah, um, uh, is there any more questions from anybody? Is there any way we could um, look 
Uh, see, it said at the beginning that it was recording the um, the the video. Is there any way we could have a look back? I, I missed something because I had a call that I wasn't expecting, and I was once I liked the pieces about the um, the geranium uh, cutting back the geranium because I've got one and it only flowers once, and I would like to. I missed that. Is there any um, any way we can see what's been shown? Yeah, you'll get you'll get sent a copy of the recording um, oh, in an email. So. Uh, you'll get that maybe later today or tomorrow. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, a top a, a tip for the Johnson's Blue Geranium certainly is is to cut it back sort of usually the end of June, and, and we call it the Chelsea Chop. You know, mm. Chelsea, when Chelsea Flower Show is usually on, um, sort of June time, that's when you sort of chop them back so that they rejuvenate really, um, and you get more flowering towards the end of summer again. So you get a double, a double flowering, which is lovely. Um, Peter's asking what the white flower in the trough is. The white annual in the trough here, that's, um, it's the Corpus snowflake, um, but it's one called Gulliver and it's, it's been engineered to be a bit bigger than the original. Are you familiar with the Corpus snowflake? Um, this, this is a similar to, to the original Bacopa Snowflake, but it's been engineered to be bigger and it's called Gulliver. Okay, thank you, Helen. Does anyone have any more questions? Seems you covered everything, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> or everyone's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put everyone to sleep. No, not at all. It was really interesting. It was really fascinating. Um, okay, I think that's all the questions then. Okay. Just to say a massive thank you to you, Helen. It was really that's good. That's okay. I'm sorry we lost the signal. I'm not sure why that was. Don't worry about it. Uh, I think the connection must have just timed out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you very much for listening and if and watching. And if anybody does want to get in touch, then please um, either email me, Helen at Helen's Herbs, or you can um, call me um, or uh, Facebook. I'm on Facebook at Helen's Herbs. Um, my phone number's on the website. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy, for all your help. No problem. Bye. Bye. Bye.